let's go ahead and go back all the way to Numbers 20. I don't know what I'll actually read from there, but if you remember this, uh, I think I'll read starting in verse 2. It says, And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we may that we and our children should die uh, should die there and wherefore have you made us to come up out of egypt to bring us into this evil place it is uh it is no place of seed or of figs or of vine or of pomegranates neither is there any water to drink and moses and aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and they fell upon their faces and the glory of the lord appeared unto them and the lord spake unto moses saying Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth uh, to them water out of this rock, out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as to him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand with his rod and smote the rock twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not um, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he... Uh, was sanctified in them. Now I'll go over to Deuteronomy 1. <clears throat> I don't know why I turned so far. That's like the next page. Deuteronomy chapter 1, look at verse 37. Now, Mo- Moses here is talking to the children of Israel and, uh, and, and kind of scolding them for their sins. And he says, Also, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither, but Joshua, the son of Nun, that standeth beside thee, he shall go thither, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. So when Moses tells a story, he kind of makes it sound like, you know, it's y'all's fault that I don't get to go into the promised land, which is partially true, because had they not did what they did, he wouldn't have done what he did. But the reality is, the Bible makes it clear that the reason he didn't go in is because he smote the rock with his staff as he had previously done on another occasion when God told him to. But this time, God hadn't told him to do that. God said, speak unto the rock. And instead of speaking unto it, he smote it, and he said, you rebels, are you going to make us? Now, God still answered the prayer, I guess you could say, still gave them the water and all that. But what, what Moses had done is really messed up God's command. And, and instead of just obeying God and going by faith, he took it upon himself and said, I did this before, and I'm going to do this again. And he kind of did it in his own strength. So God ultimately says, because of that, you know, you didn't believe me, you didn't trust me, you don't get to go into the promised land as well. And so uh, it seems like Motor, uh, Moses might be a little bit bitter right here, and he's kind of telling them, you know, it's your fault that I'm not going in. And, uh, you know, honestly, God's pretty bitter with them too. And, uh, you know, there's a, two guys that are going in, and then another generation is going to go in that wasn't part of this original true but god is kind of upset with them because <clears throat> of this as well and notice that god reminds moses at the end of this at the end of chapter 32 go to verse 44 and he reminds him, he says uh um let's see here moses made it into the speaking of these words verse 46 deuteronomy 32 46 and he said unto them set your hearts unto all the words which i testify among you this day which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you, because it is your life. Uh, and through this thing ye shall prolong your days in the land, whether ye go over Jordan to possess it. And the Lord spake unto Moses that selfsame day, saying, Get thee up into this mountain, uh, Abiram, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that it is over against Jericho, and behold, the land of Canaan, which I gave unto the children of Israel for possession, 
and die in the mount whither thou goest up and be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hor and was gathered unto his people because ye trespassed, talking about Moses and Aaron, against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah, Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, because ye sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. Yet thou shalt see the land before thee, but thou shalt not go thither unto the land which I give the children of Israel. So I know I'm throwing all that out there because I don't want to um, spend too much time on it. So I'm talking faster than my brain can actually, <laughs> my mouth can actually keep up with. And uh, so, but the idea is that I want you to see that before the children go into the promised land through Joshua, Moses is fixing to die. And he says, hey, it's been my job now to encourage Joshua and, uh, and to just give him the encouragement, exhortation. I'm not going to be able to go into the land but Joshua is going to take you in there, and he's giving them these final words, which the Bible calls a song. All right, verse 30 of chapter 31, what the, uh, Brother Austin just read, said, And Moses spake in the ears of the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. I have no idea what it sounded like. I kind of wish I did. Don't you wish you knew how some of these songs that are sung in the Bible, what it sounded like and, and what instruments were involved and all? But the reality is here it just says they spake it. He spake the words. And so it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is that he got the words across and he told them these words. And it's a very interesting story that he tells. But you know what's really interesting to me is throughout this song, he's going to use an analogy of a rock. Okay? Several times in this text he talks about a rock. And uh, let's look at a couple of those. Look at verse 4. He says, he is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Okay, so he's, he's telling the people, you know, he is the rock, he's publishing the name of the Lord, and he calls him a rock. Verse 18. Now he's going to talk about those people who... Basically, what he says is, is there's a group of people. He, basically, what he says is the only reason I'm not destroying you is because I don't want these other people who worship other gods to see that and to say, "Oh, the Lord didn't do this. We did this." Like you know, if I delivered them, in, if they delivered you into their hand and they destroyed you, they wouldn't say, "Oh, God destroyed them because they didn't obey." They would say, "Oh, God didn't. Was, their God wasn't able to deliver them." And then he says, "Like I wish." They did understand. I wish that I could use them in that way, and they would understand. And then here's what he says. Uh, of the Man, I got ahead of myself. I'm supposed to be reading. Uh, let me skip that one for now. Go to verse 31. They, he's talking about that other group of people, all the enemies, and he says, For their rock is not as our rock, even as our enemies themselves being judges. Okay, So he's like, yeah, but those other nations... Their rocks, not as our rock. Okay, so, you know, he said that the Lord is the rock. And then he said the enemy, their rock is not as our rock. And then the one that I skipped is verse 18 where he says, Of the rock that begot thee, begat thee thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Now, isn't that interesting? He says of the rock that begat thee. And then he explains by saying, you know, the Lord who uh, who formed thee. So the, we have the rock. Obviously, that's the Lord. It says that he formed them. He was their God, and he begat them. And then it says that they rejected him, or verse 15. Let's read 15. But Gershon, which is another word for Jerusalem, uh, or for Israel, waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. So describing Israel here says that they, they had that rock, they lightly esteemed it, and then they actually ended up just kind of like forsaking it or rejecting the rock. And then they took the rock, little r, of the other, of the other nations, whose rock is not as our rock. And they embraced that rock, which obviously made God mad. And I'll tell you, I, I kind of didn't really think things through as I started 
picking, I guess it wasn't really up to me, I was just following the Lord's leadership, but picking like series. Because we went through the life of Moses, naturally that went into the life of Joshua, and then I just went right into Judges after that. So in Iola, uh, Sunday mornings, we've been doing all those uh, you know, stories, so we've already gone all through this. <laughs> then on Sunday nights, I've been going through Kings, and so... Uh, you know, I've got <laughs> Joshua judges, uh, and then I've got the Kings and I'm telling you, I feel like every time I preach, it's like a broken record. I'm like, and then God raised up somebody to deliver the nation. And then they went back into sin and followed other gods. And then God just wanted uh, to destroy them, gave them up to the enemy and all that. And then, but then they cried out to God and he raised up another judge and it's just like over and over and over. And then you go through the Kings it's the same, same way. It's talking about the northern kingdom and then the southern kingdom. Southern kingdom is kind of like that. Northern kingdom is always wicked. It's just to, it's helping, God's very merciful to the very end. But God is so patient with, these peop, with his people, and, uh, and we can see that the entire Old Testament is really a picture that we can, I mean, it's, it's actual events that happen, but God records that honestly and accurately in, the, in his word, under his inspiration, and we watch how his people react to him. But go, if you would, and we've already, uh, in past messages here, going through uh, the Pentateuch here, uh, go to 1 Corinthians 10. I want to look at that again. And actually, this is really going to apply to the rest of the message here. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So why should we even read the Old Testament if it doesn't apply to us, which we all know in here that it does apply to us. But Here's what Paul says to the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Of course, he's going all the way back down to uh, starting with uh, the children of Israel going through the Red Sea, the, you know, the parting of the Red Sea and all that. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. All right. It's it's a, talking about that word meat isn't always talking about um, like animal meat, by the way. That's just talking about food. And so, he's, you know, he's obviously talking about the manna that came down, which I'll talk about here in a minute did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown. Now these things were our examples. Who's, who's our? Paul's talking to, Corinth, to the church of Corinth, and he's saying our talking about Christians, New Testament believers. He's saying these things happen for our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. He's just going through that whole story of the children of Israel in the wilderness. And he says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples that they are written for, and, uh, and I'm sorry, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the worlds are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Let me see here. I think that's good. Okay, so. Obviously, I've been trying to get through as fast as I can the story in the Old Testament, which I would imagine most in here are familiar with. But I'm doing that so that we can then turn our attention to the New Testament and say, like, well, what does this mean to us? What can we learn from this? Okay, Clearly, all of these things that Jesus is talking about, he's talking about the rock. Clearly, we understand when we get to the New Testament that rock is Jesus Christ. It just says that in our text. Okay, that rock that we're talking about here is Jesus Christ. And so let me give you three points to apply to ourselves today as Christians in the New Testament. Number one, we need to always remember the rock that begat us. 
Now you say, what do you mean? We came from rocks? I mean, uh, that's what the evolutionists believe. <laughs> but, uh, but no, we came, we didn't come from rocks, but we came from the rock. All right. Some of you are hung up. They don't believe that. Hey, let's just, let's save that for another day. Okay. Uh, we came from, spiritually speaking, from the rock. We were born of Christ. We were born of that rock. And so that's our foundation. That is who we base our salvation on. And here's the thing. Verse 4 in 1 Corinthians 10 said that it is a spiritual. And it says that the people ate the spiritual meat. Now, a couple weeks ago, I preached on the manna. And this is a very similar message. In a way, it kind of goes right along with it. Because the same thing was applied to this manna. That the people despised in the book of Numbers. And they said, oh, what is this? This light bread. They said, oh, you know, we don't have anything to eat except for this light bread. You know, interesting, this morning I was, uh, talk, I was, I was preaching on, uh, on uh, we're going through the judges, and I was preaching on Jephthah. And Jephthah, you know, he, he goes, and uh, I don't want to preach that whole thing again, but he, he goes and, and has these vain men that are with him. And so I started looking at other places where it talks about vain men. Sometimes it says vain, uh, let's see here, vain men. It talks about the sons of Belial and other times it says vain and light men. So we're talking about this light. When they say, oh, it's light bread, they mean eh, it's just no substance. There's just nothing there. It's just, it's just blah. <laughs> you know, it's just no good. And so, you know, I talked about that. Like, what are these people despising this holy bread sent down from heaven? This wonderful, like, filling bread that uh, just provided everything that they needed. And God provided that so wonderfully. It even apparently tasted good. I would say it tasted like uh, wafers made with honey, and it said it's uh, uh, something about the texture of oil, and and you know it sounds like when they first ate it, they were probably this is amazing. I can't believe God provided this holy bread. I mean, what's it called? <laughs> we'll just call it what's it called. And uh, so uh, they're eating that, and and then after a while, they're just like, you know what? I'm kind of sick of this. And I and I showed how that kind of as Christians we do the same thing. God provides His Word. He provides uh, everything that we need spiritually speaking. And we just start thinking, eh, that's not, I just kind of really want something more, more physical. You know, I want the, the, the physical pleasures, and I want what the world has. And, and uh, this is the same kind of principle that Paul is telling the church at Corinth. It says that they ate that spiritual meat, and they drank that spiritual water from the spiritual rock. And, uh, of course, the Bible talks about the water, you know, and when it comes to receiving the Word of God and, and being saved. Go to John chapter 4. And it's pretty interesting that he makes a big deal about that, that spiritual meat, which elsewhere it's called that spiritual bread as well. But, you know, the Catholics are really big on making that bread physical. It's all about the physical bread that they eat at the communion, and that becomes the physical body of Christ. But, hey, the Bible makes it clear that it's a spiritual, this whole thing that they're receiving is spiritual because God is a spirit. Okay, John chapter 4, verse 22. I hate when I forget to turn pages. John 4, 22 says, Ye worship, no, not what? We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. This is Jesus, of course, talking to the woman at the well. And kind of setting her up and, uh, and explaining something to her. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So he's not really making a dichotomy there. He's not saying, you know, one, you're not only going to be able to worship him in truth. Now you're going to have to do spirit and truth or something like that. I think he's, he's saying the same thing. You know, what we're worshiping is truth and it's not something that's physical and necessarily tangible it is tangible by faith because faith is the substance of things hope for the evidence of things not seen but but you know from the world standards this is not something that can be seen and felt and expressed this is something that's spiritual okay and this is why we want to be really careful to separate the spirit from the flesh and jesus said when he's talking about salvation to nicodemus he said that which is flesh is flesh that which is spirit is spirit marvel not that i say unto you you must be born again born of the spirit Okay, not talking about flesh. You've already been born of the flesh. And so everything that God uh, provides here 
is spiritual. And I'm not saying it won't affect the flesh and you won't be able to feel it, you know, physically to some extent. But everything that we do when it comes to receiving things of God needs to be done in spirit and in truth. Meaning, you know, hey, I don't base whether or not I'm saved, for example, on feelings. I don't just say, you know what, I just don't really feel saved today. I just really haven't had this strong desire to serve the Lord. And I've been falling back in sin and stuff like that. So, you know what, I, maybe I'm not saved. I think I'll just go uh, forward at the altar. Sorry, you won't have, it won't happen in our services because we don't give an altar call. But I'll go forward at the altar, throw myself at the throne of God, at the throne of grace. And then I'll pronounce to everybody, okay, now I'm saved. You know, I've seen guys do that. I've seen guys who were pastors who stepped down from the ministry, joined another church, went forward one day at the altar and came out and said, you know, all those years as a pastor, I was preaching the right gospel, I was doing all this, but I wasn't really saved. And they said, you know, there was sin in my life that was hidden and it was uncovered. I mean, I was covering it up and all that stuff. But today I repented and I came to the Lord and I was truly saved. There's a big problem with that doctrine. <laughs> Doctrinally speaking, you're relying on this big change of your life to decide whether or not you're saved. And that's not what the Bible says. Now, I know the verses. People are going to take it, uh, you know, well, what doesn't faith follow the, the, I mean, doesn't works follow the faith? And if you are saved, then you'll do these kinds of things. Yeah, obviously there should be evidence. There should be fruit because that's all we can see. We can't see the heart. But that's when in terms of explaining salvation, it's spiritual and it's truth. If the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, and you believe that to be true, and you decide, you make the decision to put your trust in Jesus Christ and call on the name of the Lord, like it says, then you're saved. Amen. You don't have to wonder, like, well, I don't know. Right. Let's wait a couple of days and see what really happens. You can, because it's spirit and it's, in, and it's in truth. And you don't have to come to church and be like, man, I'm just really seeking revival. And, you know, Pastor Rocky, he's just really not one of those just fiery preachers, you know. He just doesn't really stir me up or whatever. Hey, you've got the truth right here, Amen. and you've got the Spirit inside you. I'm sorry if you don't want to jump up and shout and run around circles. In fact, I don't want you to do that, to be honest with you. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, that's not the evidence that we're looking for to say, like, oh, this church, God's really moving in this church because people are jumping up and down and, and shouting and, and rolling on the floor and acting goofy. No, that would be a physical sign that, actually would kind of make me wonder the opposite. <laughs> you know, are you really receiving the Lord's, uh, the, the, you know, the Lord's uh, word in spirit and in truth, or are you looking for the fleshly you know, out, outpouring sensationalism? Okay? And so, no, we need to receive from the spiritual rock, which is Jesus, which we understand when Jesus ascended, he gave his spirit. So we're talking about that same, uh, that same rock. So the second point that I want to make here, okay, always remember the rock that begat, begat you. You know, he is the God of your salvation. Don't forget him. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget what he's provided for you, eternal life and his, his word, complete, inspired, holy word of God. Don't forsake that. Don't, and, and number two is this, don't lightly esteem him. Don't lightly esteem him. We talked about the manna and the light bread and, you know, how they just didn't, you know, just didn't feel like it was enough for them. And, and they, needed, they needed something else. They needed the leeks and the garlic and all that stuff. Look at James chapter 4. As Christians, we need to remember who our rock is. And it's interesting that the Bible uses many times, talks about Jesus being the foundation of our faith. In fact, 1 Corinthians, uh, let me just pause. Let me find James and pause there for a second before I forget. Okay, all right. So many times in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 3 is a good example. It says, uh, you know, no other foundation can be laid than is laid, which is, is Christ Jesus. And then it talks about no, uh, it talks about if any man, uh, if, if any man lay into this foundation, I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember how it goes. Uh, and then it says uh, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, and then it says all his works will be revealed by fire and all that. Okay, so what he's, what he's talking about is, hey, your found, the foundation is Jesus Christ. Okay, now the parallel to this, I believe, would be Second Peter 1, where it says, add unto your faith 
virtue and the virtue knowledge and the knowledge uh, temperance uh, or patience and then temperance and it's adding all these things to your faith. So the Christian life is based on the fact that, hey, we're saved now. We know we're saved. We're, we're, we know we're children of God. And so we need to live like God's children and we add unto that foundation. But the foundation, again, has nothing to do with those works. The foundation is Jesus Christ. You know, our salvation is based on that foundation, which, again, is called a rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, that strong foundation. It's a big rock, okay? And the church is built on that rock. Uh, upon this, you know, uh, 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 if, if any man builds upon this, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, it, it, you know, all other ground is sinking sand, but if the wise man builds his house upon the rock and the winds come and all that, and it stays firm because it's on the rock. And, of course, many analogies of that in the Bible, it's over and over because Jesus is that rock. But we also understand that Christians can even fall into, you know, we can't ever lose our salvation, but we can fall into this just not being content with that and wanting more. Look at James chapter 4. Verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And so, you know, don't get tired of this verse. It comes up a lot because I think as Christians we need to be reminded of it. Why? Because we live in this world. You know, Seven days a week, we're in this world. At least, uh, you know, if, let's say you work five days a week and you work in the world and you're constantly around the music of the world and the people of the world, the philosophies of the world. If you watch any TV or you watch any news media or whatever, Lord help you, uh, then, you know, help us because <laughs> I'm part of that too. And so you, you are going to be saturated with the philosophy and the mindset and the thinking of the world. You know, this is why... Does the Bible say you got to go to church three times a week? No, you don't even have that opportunity here. We only have two services. Does the Bible say you have to go this time and that time and that time? No. Does the Bible say you have to go to church at all? Well, it does say not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together with the believers. It doesn't say how often you need to go. But you know what? I can't imagine going a week without going to church. You know, Now, most people in here I'm looking at right now, you go at least one time a week. But, you know, for some of you, even that might be a little iffy. Like, I can't, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to, if nothing else is going on. I'm telling you, I, I don't know how you could do it. To go seven days living in the world, fasting you know, on spiritual things, really, because you're just so, now I realize you could be reading your Bible and praying. Hopefully you're doing that every day. But I'm telling you, you got to be around God's people. I got to be around that. You know, or two or more gathered together in my name. <laughs> like I gotta, I gotta have that spiritual meat uh, because you know, man, I just, I just don't understand how you can get, how you could um, just not wither away. You know what I mean? And that's just, that's just two times a week. But I'm gonna tell you, if you come on Sundays from Sunday to Sunday, at least you're getting that. But that's a long time to go without. Now again, you can listen to messages online. You can read your Bible. I understand that. And you could survive off of that, no doubt. Uh, but, you know, when the Bible says, don't, in, in, in he, he, Hebrews uh, chapter 10, not to forsake the assembling yourselves together with the believers. And it says, so much the more, as you see the day approaching, it's saying, look, the closer we get to the Lord coming back, it's so much more, like, important. Like, why, the, the things of this world become less and less important because you're like, hey, time is so short, <laughs> you know. Uh, and the time's going to come, by the way, where, it's going to be hard. Like I, we're, uh, this isn't what the message is about, but <laughs> things are going to get so rough on this earth. You know, I suppose that Christians are going to have a hard time even having a job, let alone buying, selling, trading, because they're going to get to the point where, you know, you got to have the mark of the beast in order to buy, sell, trade. You think it's going to be easy for Christians? It's not going to be easy. But you know what? As we know that that day is coming, we're going to be like, you know what? We need each other. We need to be around each other. This is way more important than the things of the world. This is way more important than even making money and all that stuff, which don't get me wrong. We need to have jobs. We need to make money, provide for our families and stuff. But in our minds, we need to be thinking, you know, what's the most important thing I need right now? That spiritual food, that spiritual worship, that time together, that fellowship with God's people, iron sharpening iron. And, and I need all that. And uh, I can't understand why people would, you know, 
be willing to go a week without uh, meeting together or multiple weeks or whatever. And I can say this as a pastor of two congregations, everybody I know that starts getting away from attending church and meeting less often, less frequent, you know, they regret it because eventually things are falling apart and they don't have that spiritual strength that they need. Uh, they're weak on issues and things aren't happening. Things start falling apart, and they're like, man, I never should have gotten away from this, you know. And I'll throw the, in not just the meeting together in corporate worship like this, but soul winning. Most of the guys in here and, and get girls in here will attest to the fact that, hey, we need to be out doing the work. And when we go out there and do the work, that strengthens us together too, and that reminds us what this is all about and why we're still alive here. We can't forget the rock of our salvation, the rock that begat us, and we can't lightly esteem it and think that it's not important. Tonight in uh, in Iola, Lord willing, I'm not ready yet, but I still got an hour and a half drive. I'm going to preach on Manasseh, all right, the worst king in Judah. And I was thinking about this as I was studying, but look at Second Chronicles 32. I'm probably just going to wrap this up here pretty quick. Second Chronicles 32. And go to verse 9. Now, at this point, the northern kingdom of Israel has already been destroyed, uh, taken into Assyria, and uh, the time's coming where that's going to happen to Judah as well. And it's primarily because what happens in this text right here with this King Manasseh of the, Ju of the southern kingdom. And he says here in uh, verse 9, After this did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, send his servants to Jerusalem, but he himself laid siege against Lachish. Uh, let me see, that's not what I want here. Maybe it's 33. Yeah, I'm sorry. Chapter 33, verse 9. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Okay, now let's stop there. And stuff's going to happen in, in Judah after this. <clears throat> but I pause whenever I read that because I've just done this series on Joshua and Judges and all of this. And I'm doing this series on the kings, like we're getting towards the end of the series on the kings. And he says, the Lord said to Manasseh, like, uh, or, or I'm sorry, it says, So Manasseh made Judah the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the God had destroyed before the children of Israel. Yeah. I'm thinking in my head, like, what a waste. It's not a waste because there's been a remnant who did do right and they did follow God and God's going to bless them uh, in the millennial kingdom, if nothing else. <clears throat> Some of them were blessed during, uh, during their life as well. But I'm thinking about, like, all of Israel is now in a condition, and multiple times in their history, we're in a condition where they're now worse off than the heathens were in that land before God kicked them off the land and put Israel in there. And I'm thinking, that's a bad condition to be in. But then I got to think about this, and some of y'all might not believe this. If you, you can't lose your salvation, okay, I understand that. But physically on this earth, if you are a Christian and you love the Lord and you know that you're saved, and you get to this point in your life where you're just like, you know what, I kind of miss the world. And you go back to the world, and you reject God, and you start living the way you once lived, which I know many a men who have done that. I know pastors who have done that. I know many, and I'm going to tell you this, the end is worse than the beginning. Look at Second uh, Peter chapter 2. Now, obviously, the ultimate end, you know, you're... If you're saved, you're saved. We don't have to worry about that. But on this earth, the destruction is coming. And you might as well do like Paul did in 1 Corinthians 5 where he says, Hey, I deliver this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that he might be saved in the day of, uh, of the Lord. 
So, uh, so where did I say to go? Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter two verse twenty. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better uh, for them uh, not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But as happened unto them according to the true proverb, uh, the dog is return, is turned to his own vomit again in the sow that has washed in her wallowing in the mire. What he's saying, what he said there is it would be better had they not to know the way of righteousness. He's talking about not being saved. Obviously, it's never better for someone not to have been saved. Okay, But not knowing the way of righteousness. <clears throat> Ignorance is bliss. Okay, <laughs> In a manner of speaking, like if you get saved and nobody ever shows you how to, how, what tithing's all about. No one ever shows you, you know, how you love your neighbor. and No one ever reads the commandments to you or whatever. Like, in a manner of speaking, that would be better than for you to know, hey, this is the way I live for the Lord. And you start taking those steps, and you're like, man, God's blessing me. Man, the relationship I have with the Lord is just so great. And then you get to this point in your life where you're just like, you know what, I'm kind of sick of that. I kind of want to go back and feed the flesh and get back entangled with the world. Hey, the end is worse than the beginning. It's not going to go well for you. God's going to destroy the flesh. Judgment begins in the house of God. He, he, he judges his people first and foremost. And so if his people are living wickedly, and then they all of a sudden fall into all this judgment and this tribulation, they're like, I don't understand. I'm a Christian. What about this guy over here? He's living worse than I am, and God's not judging him. Well, he's not even saved. God's concerned about his children, and whenever his children are a mockery to his name, because they're living in sin and they know better and, they, and they've tasted of God's goodness, but they're going back to these things. It's not going to be good in the end. It's not going to be good. And so we need to make sure that we remember every day the rock that begat us. We need to remember every day the spiritual food that he's provided for us, that spiritual drink that he's provided for us, and not to lightly esteem it. And then finally, we need to remember what their rock is. Okay, you really want to go back to Egypt? You, you really want to have the leeks and the garlic, uh, garlic at the expense of having their provisions and their, you know what I mean? This is what's so weird about, the, about Christians going back and getting entangled back in the world. Don't you remember how little the world had to offer you? I mean, look at the guys that are living it up in the world. I mean, the, the multimillionaires and the movie stars, and they've got all the fame and the popularity. I mean, most people would say, like, those guys, man, they've got it all from the world's standpoint. Look, they can have whoever they want, and they can do whatever they want. They can buy whatever they want. Why are they all killing themselves? Why are they all overdosing on drugs? Why? Are they, because none of that stuff is fine, uh, it, it, it gives any fulfillment. None of that gives any hope. It's not a foundation. It's sinking sand. It's sandstone at best. <laughs> Looks pretty good, but once you get on it, it's not going to hold your weight. Okay. And so why would you want to go back to the world? But it's so easy to forget and to fall back to that. Let's read 1 Corinthians 15, and then I'll be done. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We're going to sing that song, by the way, in a minute. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2. No, I'm sorry, verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain yea and we are found false witnesses of god because we have testified of god that he raised up christ whom he raised not up if so be that the dead rise not for if the dead rise not then is not christ raised and if christ be not raised your faith is in vain ye are yet in your sins then they also which are fallen asleep in christ are perished 
he's addressing a whole lot of false teachings and false prophets and, and stuff that they were saying in that day in regards to the resurrection. That's not my application for right now, but let's read this next part. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep? So our life as, as a Christian is based on what Jesus did for us. Our faith in the death, burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is our hope. That's a, you know, we are putting everything, we're putting all our eggs in one basket. <laughs> That's what we're trusting in for our salvation. And we are, and, and, and you know, if you're a believer and you have the Holy Spirit within you, that's satisfied. That's enough. You, you get it. You understand it provides all the spiritual food, the spiritual nourishment that you need. <clears throat> but what he's saying right here is if in this life, you know, it's, if, if it's all in vain, if, if all the blessings that you have are just simply in this life, well, then what kind of what kind of end would that be? Like, what is, what is the point? You can see why somebody then would say, I might as well just go live it up and enjoy it myself because you only got one life. How many times have you heard someone say that? Well, life is short, so go do that. You only have one life. That's totally opposite of the Christian perspective because the Christian perspective is like, hey, we're only on this earth for a small amount of time. Let's do everything that we can for the Lord because eternity is forever. And so the reality of the fact that Christ did raise from the dead and we too one day are going to raise from the dead and we're going to be, the rewards are going to be given and all that makes us say like, man, I need to be f focusing my attention on laying up treasures in heaven and serving the Lord and doing all the things. And really, it's not, it's not like he's, I don't believe that what he's saying right there is, man, we're so miserable in this life because we follow the Lord because the Christians that I know aren't miserable. <laughs> I mean, you know, the majority of the Christians I know, I should say, they're pretty happy serving the Lord. They're pretty happy with that spiritual fulfillment that they get in Christ and raising their family and trying to keep the commandments and doing these things, live a holy life. It brings happiness and it brings joy. And so I don't think that by for a minute that Paul was saying like, man, if, if it's not true, then what a, what a waste because, my, because life stunk so bad. What he's saying is it doesn't matter how good it is. If, he turn, if, if, if this is all you have to base it on, well, then sure. You're, you're most miserable because, you know, it, it, has been, uh, it has been for nothing. But you know what? The Christian life, if you're really living for the Lord, you find yourself to be very happy. You find yourself to be very fulfilled. And it's only when Christians go back and get entangled in the world where they're just like, man, life is so rough. I don't understand why it's so rough. Because you have lost that first love and you have gone back and entangled in the world you've lightly esteemed the rock of your salvation. And so we want to make sure that we never do that. And you say, well, you know, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord. I'm never going to go back to the world, which I don't think anyone in here would say that because we all know the temptation from time to time. But, you know, if somebody did say that, you've got like this much of the Bible right here to tell you that, trust me, it's going to happen. People are going to try it. They're going to say, well, I love the Lord, but you know what? I think I want to go back here. They're going to be destroyed. <laughs> God's going to raise somebody else up. And then they're going to go through the same process. They're going to be destroyed. We don't have to be that way. We can be that remnant that says, I'm just going to keep following the Lord, enjoying life, laying up treasures in heaven, and seek the blessing for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this church and the uh, uh, work that uh, is done here for you. I pray that you'll increase that work and uh, increase our abilities to uh, do more for you. <laughs> and I pray that you will just help us find the peace and comfort and reliance upon your will and your, your uh, word as you guide us uh, day by day. I pray you bless uh, those going out today, uh, soul winning. Give them boldness to speak your word. And thank you for the good weather. Keep us safe as we return home. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.